Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm a college counselor and have read applications for a small liberal arts college and two research universities. My twins are recent college graduates. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, why campus tours keep college presidents up at night. It's an article by Adam Platt, and it's in the Twin Cities Business Magazine. It's the first time we've gone to the Twin Cities Business Magazine. And I'll be with Susan Tree talking about this article. Our question from a listener will be our second question in a row from Cadence from Stuyvesant High School in New York City. And she wants to know if she's asked in an interview what other colleges is she applying to, how is she supposed to answer that question? And our interviewer kicking off a brand new interview. It is with Heath Einstein at TCU. And I team up with Julia, who's known Heath for over a decade. The two of us do that interview together as we talk about TCU. But for now, we're about to talk about this article, Why Campus Tours Keep College Presidents Up at Night. Before we dive in, how are you, Susan? I'm terrific, Mark. It's so nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, I have to give you credit because you're the one who found this article and sent it over. And uh, it brought back a lot of memories because I don't know if you, you remember this, but I, I used to run the tour guide program my first year uh, at, at West Town. So we had 90 tour guides and um, it was it's quite a quite an experience uh, working with 90 teenagers uh, as tour guides because they and especially at the school you and I worked at, they definitely don't hesitate to speak their mind and give you feedback. <laughs> That's right. And it was a beautiful thing. (laughs) Yes, yes. But of course, as we traditionally do, we have to start out with our admissions tip and with our admissions vernacular and our big number. So admissions tip today is in your application at every stage, look for opportunities to tell colleges something new about you. They always want to be learning something new about you. And one of the mistakes that applicants can make, they might uh, maybe do an essay on their experience at camp. And then if they're asked to write about an extracurricular, they go back to that same thing again. And you're wasting people's time. They're always looking for a new dimension. In fact, several colleges this year have a great question, which I love, which is tell me something that you haven't told me yet in your application. So any comments from you on that one, Susan? No, I think it's excellent advice. It's, uh, you know, if you think of the application like a jigsaw puzzle, and you as the student are trying to create a coherent picture, like, like the, t- the box top on the jigsaw puzzle, you've got to remember that each piece adds a different fraction of the large picture. And while there might be a little of those edges overlapping, each of those, uh, those jigsaw puzzles needs to bring something new and relevant to the larger picture. Yeah, well said. And, and you know, there's a lot of pressure under for mission officers to read as many applications as they can. And um, and some schools are doing it in four minutes. Some are doing it in, you know, what would you say the high side, Susan? 12, 15 is rare these days even. Um, well, still some schools out yeah. there doing 15, but not many people doing more than that. I would say, depending on the, the style of one university, um, I read four in recent years, wanted, was hopeful that you could read four applications an hour, but that was just a first reading where you were responsible for a, a quick trip through the application to make sure that it was complete, to pull out any very significant features of the application that you wanted the second reader um, to see immediately and to assign some some preliminary um ratings, academic and personal ratings, but they were, they were like the, the, 
the diving board, the initial springboard for the rest of the reading process. Another university I read for more recently was committee-based. So you were always reading in tandem with another member of the staff. And that was a more laborious process. And it was more person hours because there were two of you. And generally, the initial reading of the application took a good uh, 20, 20 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer. Well, good for you. You're working for good places because it's a common question that I ask, every, oh, not everybody, but I ask a lot of people, how long does it take to read a file? And I don't, I'm not really hearing anything that goes past 15. And when I hear no. 12, 12 to 15, that's on the higher end. No, I think there's some schools that can do an initial review in 10 minutes flat. Um, it depends what they're using as kind of their initial screening piece. You know, if, if they're screening out students very, very quickly based on their transcripts, for sure. example, then the rest of the reading is perfunctory. Yeah. It's much faster and you're, you're done very yeah. quickly. Because they deem if you'd be competitive or not competitive. That's right. You're not competitive. They go through that perfunctory motion. And, you know, and this this point has ramifications for a lot of things. So even when schools allow for for additional outside recommendations or an additional teacher recommendation beyond what they require, like ask yourself, is this new person going to add something that my previous teachers haven't added or my previous outside um, recommend recommender hasn't added? Because you know, their time is valuable and they're looking to learn something new. So I think there's just a lot of different ap applications, ramifications um, to that principle. If students can think like an admission officer um, when they when they work on assembling that jigsaw puzzle. Well, and I can tell you truthfully, Mark, that there in my reading experience in recent years, there are a lot of pieces of the application that um, as a reader, I would read the opening and the closing and I pretty much knew in about a minute whether or not, it, whether it was a piece of writing that the students submitted or a letter of recommendation on the student's behalf, I could do a very quick assessment to see if it was going to be adding anything of value. So I think you're right. Students need to say, what is the value of this piece going to be? Absolutely. Great. I love it. I love it when you share your insights and experiences, Susan. They're awesome. I'm going to stick with uh, the theme of our article today for our other point. So back on episode 231, I had an admissions vernacular that was related to the tour, and it was the million dollar walk. And now we have another term. I don't hear it that often, but every now and then, the golden mile, the golden mile. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that million dollar walk and that golden mile um, later today. Right from the article, again, our big number. Now, I was torn between so many big numbers on this. So I'll share. Did I go with 32? Did I go with 2795 or four to 5,000? Let me read the quote from the article. In 2022, data shows spending is up 32 percent from 2020 among the cohort of private colleges that responded. That was to a study done by RNL, Ruffalo, Ruffalo Noel Levitz, who that firm has come up quite a bit recently in our, in our discussions. Uh, and they're in this article as well, talking about how much money colleges are spending per student they recruit. So 32% increase in the last two years, average spending $27.95. But the article goes on to say that most of the colleges in the cohort weren't the most expensive ones. And some of the most expensive ones are spending between four to $5,000 per student that they recruit. So several big numbers there. Pick and choose whichever one you like. <laughs> Burger King, have it your way. <laughs> and now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. All right. I'm going to give a, a brief summary of the article, Susan, and then I want you to chime in in your own way with a lot of uh, personal experience and insights on a really important topic. So, you know, the article starts out, uh, Adam Platt, um, talking about how much has actually changed in the world of college admissions and how there was no social media now, and now you're getting all this information by social media. But he said one thing that's still very similar to his experience 40 years ago is the college tour. And he remembers taking a tour and ended up going to Twin Cities and liked it and he stayed and 
became a student there, and now he's here helping his daughter out. He's helping out another relative, and he's seen the impact of this tour. And so his daughter had had an experience where she'd had all these positive interactions before with admissions directors and different people before a trip. And then they they got on a trip to a school, and he just describes it as a, a Midwestern school in an isolated location. And um, I'll quote from the article. It says, when so they go on the tour. It sounded like it was almost like one of these class day visits where they break students up for an open house and they do separate programming with parents. And it says, uh, quote, when we when we re- reunite with our kid after the tour, uh, sh- she declines the provided lunch in the student center. She says, let's go. I respond, are you sure? You don't want to stay a bit longer and talk to students? No, I'm done. On the way home, my kid says that the tour guide spent a substantial amount of time explaining their gender gender dysphoria and how the college paid for materials for them to transition to non-binary status. It was designed to spread an air of inclusivity, but it left the impression that this is a school for kids struggling with their identity. So then he, he shares that experience and he goes on to say, tours are a high stakes game. Schools invest all this money and then it comes down to the experience on the tour. And he has another story he also s- shares with, with another relative who had a similar type of unpleasant experience. Um, I have that one right here. Um, the quote from the nephew, pronouns are front and center at the school would seem to turn my nephew off. He has nothing in common with the tour guide, a young individual who goes by they, them, and is on the introverted side. After we're done, I ask my kin, would he like to walk around the neighborhood and meet more students in the student center? And he's, he says, I've seen all I need. So he shares these two experiences to talk about the power of the tour. This is keeping college presidents up. Then there's a quote from several people in the article, everyone from Angel Perez, the CEO of NACAC, to a number of other um, consultants and talking about the the tour and former admission directors. Uh, One quote here says, the tour and campus experience are something you have little control over, explains Lauren Robinson, retired dean of admission at McAllister. Uh, The perceived value to students is exactly that. And one of the things, the points that the article, I don't necessarily agree with that, by the way, Susan, but we can talk in a second. (laughs) But uh, uh, the article goes on to talk about um, how certain schools, and I don't know how they come up with this figure, but they use the term 25%. They say if you get twenty, have a 25% acceptance rate or lower, then you can afford to have a bad tour experience because you just have so many students that you're flush with. But if your acceptance rate is higher than that, so much depends on that experience when people are on campus and and there's a lot of factors outside your control. So this is keeping admission officers up and is keeping presidents up. And it also goes in to talk about the shrinking student body and the demographic trends. And now college applicants are down, especially male applicants are down. And it's putting more and more and more pressure on schools to have to nail it out of the park uh, when students set foot on their campuses but yet so much is uncontrollable or difficult for them to gauge. And then it does share some research that says that more than anything, when students set foot on a campus, they're looking to see, do they find people who are like them? And whether, if they find people that they can connect with, then they're most likely to, to think that the school could be a good school. So I, I want to have some dialogue. That's, a, I think, enough of an intro. and We can kind of take it Take it where you want to go with it, Susan. But um, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, that was a great synopsis, Mark. And this is, I think, a fascinating topic because it it touches almost everybody in the in the uh, college bound community in some way, shape, or form. Um, even a virtual visit to a campus uh, can come across as highly inauthentic. Uh, let alone an in-person. I think when a family goes through the trouble of visiting a campus, their expectations are very, very high that they will get a well-rounded, comprehensive um, visit and picture that is both emotional and um, cognitive. And we know any time that we go anywhere and, and deal, especially in a new situation, 
we we are affected by it in those two ways. You know, the cognitive, which are our, our brain is processing facts and figures, uh, the the academic or intellectual dimension, um, and then the heart that is is processing the emotional reaction. And there are a few examples I think as dramatic as a as a college visit by a prospective family that is um, as difficult for them, the prospective the buyers, let's say, to keep a balance between the the rational and the emotional. It, it's just the way it is. I, I, I liken it to shopping. I hate to uh, reduce yeah. it to that, but if I have to go get, you know, go get an outfit for, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to be a guest on a TV talk show, or I'm going to go for a job interview, or I'm going to go to a wedding, or someplace where I'm making a public, up close and personal you know, appearance, um, and I go to get an outfit, it's agony because I might say, well, this is going to look okay on me, but I'm not, I'm not in love with this. It's not going to make me comfortable. It, it doesn't suit me. It doesn't represent me. And families bring, bring so much background and so many uh, prejudices and so many aspirations to visiting a college campus. They color they color the experience, say they, they inform the experience in a way that they are barely aware of the same way that I walk out of the department store, having bought something that maybe uh, intellectually it was a good choice, but it's, I'm probably not even going to wear it, you know, because it didn't grab me by the heartstrings, you know, and, and affect me that way. So that's my favorite uh, analogy, but. I want to, can I say something on that? Because sure I are. use the same analogy. So when I'm, when I'm talking with my families, and, and I literally say this, I just said it last night, I said to a dad, I said, let's say you got a job promotion and you have to move to Dallas right now. I said, there's a lot of things you can do from your computer. You can figure out what the commute would be like if you live in this neighborhood to where you have to work. You can look at crime data. You can look at cost of living data. You can look at school districts and how they're rated. You know, I said, and you can even you can even do virtual tours through the houses on your computer on Zillow or something like that. I said, but there's no substitute for you getting in that car, you know, with your wife and driving around and actually driving in the neighborhood and getting going inside the home. There's a sense of feel that you only get from that in-person experience. And that's why we all, I always say there is no substitute for an in-person visit as much yeah, as I bullish agree. as I am on, vi on all these new online tools and you should do them. You know, you can save yourself a lot of wasted time and money through your online research so that you can ferret out schools that, you know, wouldn't be a match, but there's a sense of feel that you get when you visit. And, and I tell people to trust their instincts. I know that doesn't sound analytical, but I do believe that there can be a component of who you are that uh, in some ways a college is like a magnet. It can draw you in or it can repel you. Yeah. Susan, I remember you always saying this. I, I, I borrow this term from you. Is it, is it singing at you? You used to say that to students. Remember that? Is the school <laughs> singing at you? Can you hear so the I, music? <laughs> yeah, I stole that from you. But, but um, I, I, I think sometimes there's, a component of who you are that you don't even, you're not even in touch with. That's right. Cause you know, this is the weirdest thing. Cause I don't know if this is your experience, but if I'm visiting a campus for the first time, normally the impression that I have in the first five or 10 minutes is very similar to what I have. If I'm there for four, six or eight hours. Now I learn a lot of things cause I'm in presentations and all that, but just that in this initial sort of visceral reaction I find that it's pretty similar. And um, I know that sounds super anti-intellectual. I'm not certainly not encouraging just drive up, see a place and leave. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that. But I do think that sometimes there's components of who we are that we don't even know how to articulate. We're not even in touch with all of our emotions. And I'll tell you, you know, it's fun talking with you, Susan, because we have so many students that we, we work together. Of course, you remember Katie McKinstry, one of our superstars we worked with together. And I remember her telling me, I was talking with her about another one of her friends who was having a hard time making a decision. And she was like, poor student, she needs to just trust her gut. Oh. And, and um, you know, I found that that's pretty good advice. 
No, I, I, I agree. The, the thing is, Mark, though, that the, the older we get and the more experiences we have, we are able to balance the cognitive and the affective. Yeah. And we're, as parents, as, as counselors, we're able to have reactions and acknowledge them. Uh, but then we're also able to balance them with, with facts. And that's important. You know, that's why it's so important for kids to see a variety of colleges and universities and not just visit the kinds of schools they, as sophomores or juniors, they think they're going to like. Because sometimes, you know, sm all small colleges don't come across the same way. Sure. All big universities don't cr come across the same way. Not all urban colleges don't all come across the same way and neither do rural schools. So we tend to, to classify colleges into categories that then, um, you know, it's like a quadrant. But that we, you and I know that this isn't true, that they, they all overlap. and Definitely. Um, but, you know, how, how a college controls the visit uh, is, has got to be authentic to yeah. um, the product that they're, that they're selling. And I think that's where colleges fail a lot of the times, that they, they're, leaving, they're leaving too much up to chance and they're expecting a family to absorb a holistic impression of the college, both in terms of facts and figures and the the emotional impact of the beauty of the campus or the the wonderful proximity to the local town or or you know the uh, historic architecture they they don't control enough for everything that the family's bringing to that visit and it it creates um, an impulsive reaction on the part of a lot of families. Um, you know, when I was, you know, first in admissions, um, I knew there were families that, that parked in the parking lot of the admissions office and then left, you know, that, that there was a visceral reaction, you know, that that wouldn't have been my child. <laughs> I would have dragged my child out of the car and gone on that tour for, you know, educational purposes, because it, it is like shopping. You've got to try on a lot of outfits, and see how they look on you. See how they make you feel. You can't just look at them in a catalog. And we've all made terrible mistakes in our lives of ordering things online um, or based on someone else's impression, and they don't fit. You know, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember this, but there, there was a little book. Uh, it didn't really get that famous, but I really liked it. It was around when you and I were working together at West Town by a guy named Marty Nemco. And it was called, it was called, you're going to love this college guide. It's been out of print since like 03 or 04 now, but I really liked that little book. And, and the one thing that stuck out to me is he, he used, he, his advice to students before the tour was to repeat multiple times to yourself. I will not be influenced by the weather and I will not be influenced by the tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> because he found those were things that were so could so subjectively bias you. You get a rainy day. Uh, another story from our past. Of course, you remember Bob, the business manager. I was helping him out with his daughter. He they came back from a series of schools, college visits. And one school I thought they'd be very excited about. They, they were not not impressed with at all. And and I was talking to him and he said, we had a tour, terrible tour guide. And, and I remember saying, well, you know, sometimes that's just a little random, you know, maybe you could have got a different one and you might have had a totally different experience. And I never forget. He said to me, he said, if I go and I get a bad tour guide, I can only come to one of two conclusions. Either that's the best you've got, or you don't care very much. And neither option is good. <laughs> and I really, I really didn't have a comeback for him, but I did have a student maybe the last year or the year before. Same thing. I really thought they were going to like this school. They visited. They didn't like it. It wasn't that far from their home. And, and it, but it was like torrential rain. It was really bad, bad weather. And so I did challenge them. I said, you know what? I, I really think you might like this school. I said, why don't you see if you can get back on a better day? And they actually did. And they did have a good oh. experience. So that sort of speaks to your point about how we have to be careful about not just having sort of knee jerk reactions that aren't right, balanced right. with data. 
as well. But you know, you, you on some level, mm-hmm. you, you know, you've got to let that go because it is what it is. I mean, when I worked at a liberal arts college in Maine, at, at, that only enrolled ten percent of its students from the state of Maine. Yeah. We were all, we were what we what was called a destination college, meaning that people didn't drive by casually and say, "Oh, look, let's go visit a college," because we're driving by and there it is. They were in Maine for a reason. They had come from far away. Uh, no one came unintentionally. So chances are it was going to be their only time to visit. And because we were a college that said to families that, uh, or said to applicants that if they didn't have a personal interview, they were placing themselves at a disadvantage, that we wanted to meet every applicant. And we could do that either on campus at the time of the visit, or we would arrange to do it off campus somehow swing that. But so when when the weather was bad, I felt personally responsible. I really did, because I knew it was very unlikely that they would come back. But I learned to develop a, a, a way of framing that for a family, this for spinning it and saying, well, you know, if you love it on a rainy day, you know, you came to Maine because there was something magnetic about looking at colleges in vacation land. That's what the license plate says. And (laughs) this is a a magnificent state and we actually have better weather. Uh, You know, if you're, if you're a winter sports person or you love, love spring or fall, we're better than practically. So I had, you know, we learned a way to spin it and our tour guides were trained to always during the tour to emphasize how they took advantage of their surroundings what was it that was uniquely special and wonderful about their their main experience? So we we capitalized on why we knew a family was coming to visit us in the first place, right? And then we would we would hammer on that uh, during the tour. I mean, we that was one of those things tour guides were trained to reference. And so it sometimes helped lift families out of the, oh, it's a rainy day. It must be a terrible college, you know, kind of reaction. Because on some level, we could do that with humor um, and and storytelling. But that was about the best, you know, that we could do. Yeah, and that's why when, 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 when Bob made that statement, I, I really couldn't fault him because mm-hmm. the tour guide, when you're the tour guide, you are the school. It's like the admission officer. You're right. I mean, you know, this is colleges would visit us at West Town, and the, if if they were friendly and personable, and they connect with the students, then that the student thinks this friend the school is friendly and warm. If they were exactly. cold or distant, or or maybe even just not that not the type of that person, right? It could be somebody could be seen as whatever too jockey, too preppy, too fraternity, or too crunchy, or whatever You're whatever right. buckets you want. If you, that's not one thing, I did agree with the article is that people are looking for people. That they will connect with. Yes, like them. See, I'll disagree on that point, though, with you, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. I think they're looking for for enough of a place where they're going to connect, where they're going to fit. But a lot of kids are dying to break out of the high school social world. And they're they're actually looking to broaden that view. I think I think it's two sided. They don't want to be the only person who looks like themselves there. But you know what? A lot of kids are looking to reinvent themselves to a certain extent anyway. And they they might not want to go to a college where everybody looks very contrary to what makes them comfortable. But on the other hand, that can be, you know, seeing diversity, seeing um, a really big range of interesting people that they would be find cool to get to know. I think can be very, very attractive. If, there, if there's too much of a stereotypical uh-huh. um, uh, look to the students, they may say, "Well, that's me," but is this going? Isn't this going to be just like my high school? And of course, we know it's not. But but some kids can get turned off by that. But I think it's that psychological balance between I won't be the only person like this, but on the other hand, I'm so excited to be in the mix with a lot of different kinds of kids. I, I certainly was that way coming from New York city and looking at non-urban schools. I couldn't wait. Um, I, I didn't look at urban universities because I absolutely did not want to recreate my, 
high school experience and have all I, those. I mean, uh, I, I literally had this situation earlier today. I had a session with somebody from 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 um, um, a New York City school. And they just said, I can't do it, uh, you know, because I thought Stony Brook was a good match for them. No, too close. Too close. You know, yeah, Seton too Hall, many, too, too close. Yeah. Even Rochester was too close. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, had to get, they had to get out of the state. So so I definitely know that they're, they're I mean, there's a, it's always in that nuance because people do, a lot of students want diversity. And a lot of times we'll, we'll hear students say, it's too many kids like my high school there. We'll hear that a lot. So there's definitely that side of it. But there's another side that, you know, it's funny when I used to do interviews, my favorite question was, what's your biggest fear? And this is me anecdotally, 70% of people had a social fear. It was, sure. it was, it was, will I like them and will they like me if I had to summarize it? So, so I think there's that sense of belonging that people want. Yes. But yet, but yet not carbon copy, not everybody like an automaton, all the same. You know, I struggled with this when I was running the tour guide program at Westtown because my view was very much like we're traveling all around the world and the country recruiting. And when you expect to see a tour guide, you expect a certain element of professionalism. So. I'm really going back old West School Town talk here, Susan. But you know, we had one star dress and two star dress, right? So, so one of our requirements was they earn one star dress, which was more like, as you say, business casual, kind of. But the kids they they pushed back on that, and you know, it was the corporatization, and it was marketing, and it was you know, if I want to wear my torn, tattered, frayed, you know, like they thought it was trying to present the school differently than it was, and so that was their pushback. You know, and my pushback was was like kind of like I say for a lot of things, if it's an interview or something like that, I think there's an expectation of a certain element of decorum and professionalism. And so there was some there was some tension there. I'm not saying who was right, but, you know, I know that we're traveling all over and working really hard to bring families here. That's right. I realize we have a couple hours to make a good impression and we're not trying to be somebody we're not, but we're also not trying to be dingy and, 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 and project low standards. And so there's somehow there's a balance there. Well, and, and kids, both high school tour guides and college tour guides have a hard time understanding that they're not just representing themselves, that they're representing an institution made up of a lot of different kinds of people. And they have to find a way. And the admissions office, I think, is the one that has to identify what that, that corporate you know that, and when I say corporate, I don't mean business. I mean, sure. you know, the body. Um, what what an image is that uh, will uh, be be okay will make you approachable to any family that came to visit. And a lot of colleges use um, uniforms. You know, the the kids have their their khakis and their polo shirts, and it identifies them as a, as an ambassador for the college. And I wasn't all that aware of that. Uh -huh. My college never did that. Uh -huh. I think it, they would have been, the kids would have been up in arms, but <laughs> instead L.L. Bean was their uniform, right? I hate right, to tell right. them that they were in uniform. Right. <laughs> but, but that had become very, fairly common. And I think yeah. as colleges moved toward paying their tour guides, they were able to exert more, uh, more higher standards, certain standards for for that, because, you know, the art major tour guide has to be able to talk to the prospective physics major and the the engineering tour guide has to be able to talk to the prospective French major. You know, rarely do families get assigned a tour guide and occasionally it happens. It happened to me when I was touring with my kids. Occasionally it is an assignment where when you register for the tour, the student prospective student says, this is what I'm interested in. And, you know, I even, my, my twins and I went to a college for a tour where the, the tour guide was a twin. And I said, <laughs> you're kidding me, right? You're kidding me. Right. And she said, this was accidental. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> she said, it really was. But when I saw someone was coming with twins, I thought, why not? I should, sure. I should do this. Cause I get, I get it. And, you know, but that it colleges, um, have been able to up their standards and their expectations since they started paying, which I always 
felt was an anathema. I thought it was a volunteer experience. I think it showed, I thought it reflected poorly to have to pay tour guides. And now I totally buy into it. I, yeah, I totally I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think they work hard enough. You know, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I, I mentioned when I was doing my summary, I don't really agree that you're kind of at the whim to whatever reaction people get. There's certain things that are outside of your control. Certainly you're, you know, like we said, weather having a bad, well, maybe a mismatch personality wise or culture wise, or if somebody just thinks your school is too urban or too remote, or they think the campus isn't, you know, to their aesthetic appeal, like some of those things. Yes. But there's a lot of things that schools can do. Like, you know, you you know, I got back from Marquette recently and there, every single thing they did was so impressive to me. Like right from the time I signed up, how personal the communication was. Now they give every single student their own one-on-one tour. Wow. Tour guide. Everyone. And we probably had 30, 35 people there that day. And you know, everybody they gave, had they, their own tour guide? And they guide? gave me two because they knew that I was, you know, a counselor. Um, and, and just how customized they made everything to each family. Um, then sometimes, you know, sometimes schools break up students from parents and do different things and do programming. And um, you, there's a lot of decisions that you can make. If you customize, you can go where the student wants to go to their interests. Now, I know that I realize the kind of manpower that takes, and I'm not trying to pretend that every single school could do that. That would be difficult. But I do strongly believe that it's not just a crapshoot, throw your hands up in the air and it is what it is. Some things are that way, but there's a lot of things by careful planning and organization and putting resources. And it's everything to how personable the greeters are when they meet you when you walk in. Yep. Obviously, you know, I think Drexel does a good job of this. There's other things that are part of that experience, like some schools give you the, well, I'll use an example. When I visited Lynn in Boca Raton, you know, they did everything from, they had Joy's name. She, they were recruiting her for basketball for a while. So they had her name in the parking spot when you pull up, something that High Point is known for, yeah, for doing. That's, that, I'll tell you, Mark, that's the one thing that made me cry when I took my kids on their first round of college visits. Yeah. I was so I was so surprised by that in all my years of being in the business. I didn't yeah. know colleges and there I, we drove into the parking lot and yeah. I was, I was done. <laughs> yeah. So, but so you see the impression it can make, Oh my you gosh. know, the, and I then, know. and then sometimes they know some stuff about you. You come in, there's a little bit and they know about you. It makes a great impression. I know when we were at Lynn, they signed, they assigned um, a designated student to have a one-on-one lunch you know, that was great. And it's not something we had to request. Some schools are letting you sit in classes. Some schools are letting you meet with a professor that you're interested in. That's right. Some some schools are allowing you to come back and have a one-on-one with the regional rep. I mean, like there's a lot of things that schools can do, in my opinion, to present warmth and customization. And I think they're really missing an opportunity when they don't do that. Um and so I think that, you know, I feel really strongly about that. And, and I feel strongly about re- reps as well. Like you have, when you have reps on the road, you have to have people that connect well with people. I mean, we've all seen these reps who are on the road that have no personality and people don't like the school because the rep didn't connect with them on a personal level. And, and schools are spending all this bad. money. That's all this hiring, money. hiring and training. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and evaluation. Yeah. But we've seen it over and over. And you know the difference that a a good rep that connects with people can make in terms of drumming up interest in the school, at least getting people to put it on on a longer list of research and maybe a visit list. I mean, I mean, I will even see it from people we interview. I mean, sometimes if an interview really, really connects on the podcast, you know, we'll get such a difference in the response from people like I'm adding that to my visit list. We're going to research that. I mean, even, even in a format, like a podcast, an ability for somebody to connect can lead to either spiking up interest or just kind of falls a little flat. Well, the expression of interest has to be mutual. And this is what I think is missing from a lot of training, both of, of tour guides and of admission counselors is that, uh, there's the public relations advertising dimension 
of the job. You're representing the school, you're conveying information, you're emphasizing the mission or the what the takeaway is that you've all decided you want a family or in a school community, the college counselor to have. But sometimes what's missing is the the an understanding of the value of making it a human level of communication. The in fact, I think the article made a reference to that, that when a tour guide actually shows interest in the family and in the prospective student in particular, parents, you hope, are at the back of the tour guide crowd. You know, they're letting the kids walk up front with the tour guide if, if they're multiple families. Um, but where a tour guide's actually like, you know, hey, well, where are you from? And uh, where do you go to high school? And, and oh, wow, you're, are you an athlete or, you know, you're an artist or what do you hope we're going to see and learn about on this tour. That to me is one of the most important things for a tour guide to say at the beginning of the tour is what do you hope to learn from this tour? And then the tour guide can say, well, you know what? We're not going to be getting into the art studios on the tour, but I'm going to point out the building to you. So when we're done, take, take 20 minutes or so and walk over there and make sure you go in and look at the studios. You know, that kind of bridge building between valuing what the student came to learn about and how they're gonna spend their time on the campus. But, you know, most of the time it's a kid with a bullhorn and, sure. uh, you know, it's the same the same messaging. And any of us who've been in PR or advertising know you can't sell the same product the same way to all the people. It just doesn't sell. No, there, there's, I do see some really creative things out there. I like, like, I mean, I like some, some tour guides give you their business card. If you have any additional questions, some follow up with you afterward. Some, some of them will sort of coordinate like, oh, you're interested in art history. Would you like for me to have somebody reach out to you? Like, those are things that. That's incredible. Really go far. And, and, and when you think of you know, how competitive it is out there. Um, why, why not? Why not do go the extra to put these well, things in place? You know, you don't if you're only admitting a quarter of the kids who apply anyway, and you're you're firmly ensconced in the top, you know, X number of colleges in X ratings. And, you know, a lot of things, if they're speaking for your college to the public, you don't have to do all that. You know, I used to have kids um, at West Town, I used to have kids come back from tours at places like like Yale and the University sure. of Chicago and say, well, I learned a lot about the architecture. <laughs> and I'd say, well, but what about student life and the college system and the the uh, the, the blah, blah, blah. And they're like, Matt, we learned a lot about the history and the architecture. And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, the tour guides were trained to do better than that. But the the overwhelming impression they took is basically they were being shown around by a docent as opposed to someone who was in the middle of their college experience because they were so scripted. Yeah, there's no doubt that the schools that either don't get as many applications or have lower yields, they have to work harder. Right. They have to work harder. I, I think I shared this um, on the podcast once before, but I I was um, meeting with a representative from a women's college, and we were just having a really good long conversation about admissions recruiting and um, and she was talking about just the challenges it is because so many of the young ladies won't even consider them and then fit, then they can't look at the men. And I was sharing that, you know, one of the things I didn't learn it toward my end of my time recruiting, but I really found these receptions were really a powerful way to recruit. Like, you know, you get, you know, you get some long alumni and some parents and your who your stakeholders are in the area. And if you could have them into a home or something like that, and I was just speculating that maybe that's something that might be effective for them to try. And then she and she was like, Mark, we do one better than that. We meet every single one of our applicants at like a Starbucks. Wow. Yes. Because, you know, they were that precious and that we have to try to convert them. And yeah, if you're a Yale or you Chicago, one, you don't have, you know, you have so many applicants that um, you could never do anything like that. But you also don't need to do it from a standpoint of you'll still have a steady stream of people that are going to enroll. And then the other thing too, because of the cachet of your name, you don't really have to nail it out of, knock the ball out of the park. A lot of times for people still to be interested. Right. 
if you hit a seven out of 10 on your tour, there's a good chance that you're still going to be interested. But I was always really competitive. And, and, the, and a lot of admissions people, I think, are. And you still do have competitors that also have brand name. And Yale still wants to beat Harvard, right? And, you know, sure. and that's still going on. And so sure. I still think that sometimes some of those more competitive schools, not always, because some of them do amazing jobs on their visit programs. But, but um, I think that they still need to be on their game if they want, you know, in admissions, you still like to get your top applicants. And you know this, even as an admission officer, you get attached to kids and your favorite kids, whether it was the essays or the interview or the recommendations, or you met them somewhere and they, they, they connect with you and you want those kids at your school, That's right. even no matter how strong your brand name or your selectivity is. And these still can be the things that can cause you to lose an applicant. You're probably not going to lose to a school with no brand name, but you're, if, you know, if you're strong enough to get into the most selectives and th- you're not only getting into one most of the time, unless you ED, you know, that you, there's still, there's competition at every level is what I'm trying to say. That's right. <laughs> and these things still make a difference. Well, and, and was it, um, Jeffrey Salingo that does the buyers and the sellers? Yes. Yeah. Salingo. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. I think, I think the, the sellers are selling and, and the buyers are buying and, um, you're right. There's always competition. There, there's always one more level in in uh, the college rankings or um, the college 15 miles away that you know does one thing better and or the pecking order. Now I know it's um, well. Look at the yield. I mean, I mean, if you look at the most competitive brand names in the country, you take away ED and their yield is not as high as you would think it is. You know, You're like those ED stats are inflating the yield numbers. Of course. You take away you take away early decision, and a lot of them are not getting one out of two kids. They're losing more than they're winning, even at at the highest levels. And, That's right. and so so it's super it's super competitive because you know whatever whoever you are, you're Duke and you have a lot of name, but the kid that gets in Duke's getting in Northwestern. You know, well, and especially with merit money in the play, Correct. if you're no matter how prestigious you are, when your institution gives no merit money. Uh, you're up against schools that are going after the student that you've admitted with with uh, you know pretty substantial financial incentives, and that can that's probably where the greatest losses are. Yeah, that that's I mean your brand name has to be really really strong. That's why I, I'm I'm always watching certain schools that give no merit to see how long they can continue to do that. Um, what's his name who who writes for about money for the New York the guy who wrote the price you pay for college Ron Lieber. Yeah, Ron Lieber, he's spoken out about this. You know, he's been very, how much longer can Carleton not give merit money? It would be very interesting. We saw Connecticut College had to stop, you right. know, from doing that. And and all Franklin those Ohio Marshall. schools. Yeah, yeah, there's um, so many. Dickinson, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they've all had to because it's real. I mean, your brand has to be so strong to not only do I like you, but I'll pay another 100000 over four years after taxes. You know, Yikes. Um, you know, and so... Um, but this was a good article, Susan, and thanks for sending it my way. Yeah, no, I thought it was really interesting. I, and, you know, my advice for families, Mark, is that as they embark on, on college tours, mm-hmm. uh, talk a lot in advance, educate each other in your family. I used to say to, to kids, uh, you're the professor, you're the, you're the expert on this college. I want you to sit down with your parents or whoever's going with you and, you know, give them kind of insight into the 10 reasons why, why you want to visit that college. You know, what's, what's made it so interesting to you that it's on your visit list and why, and then what, what are the things you are hoping to learn while you're on that campus and leave as little up to chance as possible. And while you can't control everything, when you go into a campus visit, whether it's an interview, a group information session, a student-led tour, um, a a symposium, an academic symposium, have goals for yourself as a prospective student as to what uh, what you want to learn and take responsibility for preparing yourself just like you would for a job interview where you're not going in as a a ignoramus. Um, Some students used to say, oh, no, I just I don't want to know too much. I just want to go and let it kind of wash over me. I'm like, well, that's, you know, good for you. But I think that's probably not the most um, intelligent way to to go into it. And 
you know, be enough present in the tour that if a, a guide is not meeting your needs, then you're able to exert some questions, some suggestions as to how how they might better meet your needs. And you know, most teenagers wouldn't dream of doing that. But you know, if you're prepared as a teenager, if you're armed with um, information and questions, you'll be much more ready to engage, not just be a observer in a tour, but you'll be, be an, an engaged participant. And that will elevate the value of any tour, even if you have nothing in common with the tour guide and you're getting a mixed vibe, like in the article, you know, the, the cases where kids got really mixed vibes from their tour guides. If you're better prepared, you're more able to engage with that person and find out more about how, you know, how you would find your tribe at that college uh, with all due respect for whatever they are representing. You know, it's just like when you're an engineering perspective student and you've got an art major for a tour guide, you've got to make it work for yourself. Yeah, and the other thing that I like to tell students is you don't have to settle for just the, the cookie cutter approach that every school does. Like you're, you know, this is a huge investment of your time and resources. And so if somebody's important to you ahead of time, you can set up meetings to meet with them, you know, got a learning disability, you know, meet with the disability services so you can see how they would serve your kid concerned about job placement. Yep. You know, set up something with the career, career center. Services. That's right. Right. Want to be a double major and don't know if you can do chemistry and French, like meet with somebody and take control over the situation. But how would they do that, that, Mark? How would you suggest they make that happen? Yeah. So, you know, I go back and forth in a couple of ways. The one is just to reach directly out to those people yourself and say ahead of time, you got to give them a little bit of notice because people are busy. I'm going to be on your campus and so and so. I would love it if I could meet you. Um, and the other is to communicate with your regional admission officer, say it'd really be important to me if I could do this. And I go back and forth because there's advantages to both. Like with the regional admission officer, sometimes they'll have that, oh, you want to talk to someone in history? We've got that person who's our liaison and they're really perky and they're personable. But then when you do it yourself, sometimes sometimes you just get to see the schools more naked. Like, let me just reach out and see whether I have a warm experience. Um, and I go back and forth between which one is better. But I do think it's important. Like you, like sometimes people are so focused on themselves making an impression. Even in interviews, when I do interview prep, I get this a lot. Everything is the focus is always on the impression that they're going to make. And I want them to see this is an opportunity for you to learn things about the school that you're not getting answers to anywhere else. That's right. And that's, and that's the same thing on the tour. So, like, what are the important questions that you need answered for you to know where this school is? And who would be the people that could answer that? It may not necessarily just be the tour guide. Uh, most schools are more than willing to accommodate that if you don't last minute them and you, you set it up in advance except perhaps the most selective universities where they really do put some distance between prospective families and the faculty. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you might be able to sit in on a class that's coming back now after the pandemic. Sure. And sometimes that may be, you know, if you're interested in Egyptology and you're visiting a university that has one of the, you know, one of the few departments where undergraduates can, can study that, then you, you're going to stand a chance. That because a faculty member, you could say, I've read your research. I've used your research in a couple of papers. Um, could I sit in on a class? I would love to have the chance to meet you and watch a class in action. That you're more likely, I think, to get get some traction with than saying, I'd like to sit with you for an hour in your sure. office no, one-on-one. Yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> but at a, at a college that has to sell itself more aggressively, right. sure. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're a musician... Go sit in on a rehearsal. Yeah. You know, if you, I, I was talking to one of my students the other day who is a, a Sikh Hindu, which carries with it a rich cultural and religious tradition. And he's getting a little nervous about, you know, how much do I need to fit in? How much do I not need to fit in? And I said, 
So you ask your admission, first you look to see if there's an affinity group, a club on the website, and then see if you can meet with one of those students or the faculty advisor when you're on campus. If you don't see anything, ask your admissions counselor, you know, are you aware of any uh, students of, of seat background with maybe I could have lunch with or a professor who would be willing to speak with me. They'll fall all over themselves to find somebody to help um, you see yourself when you're from a, a fairly unusual cultural background or religious background. You're perhaps a, an element of diversity that they would be very, very interested in. And they'll, they'll do everything they can to help you see yourself there. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, the public doesn't always know how much schools see themselves as a learning laboratory. And if they can assemble as many different perspectives as possible in a, in a context where people are open to learning from each other, like that's a lot of the secret sauce where the learning occurs. And so much of it is even outside the classroom, in that's the right. di dining rooms and the dorms. And so they're they're looking to especially, you know, in a liberal arts context, they're looking to challenge pre-held notions and expose you to different ways of thinking and cultures. And, and that's, that's kind of the magic of the education. That's right. That occurs. The other thing that I like students to do, I mean, I'm really big and our regular students know this on randomly talking to students and outside of who the admission office assigns to you, but I won't repeat that because I've talked about that a lot. But I do like students to, at the very end, even before they start talking in the car with their parents, um, whether they're putting notes in their phone yep. or they're journalers, or nowadays, you know, on the iPhone, you just hit voice memos and just talk and yep. just leave your impressions overall um, about the place before you start having the conversations in the car with everybody. Because it is true, you know, a lot of families use their spring breaks and these breaks where they go on these big tri trips where they're visiting multiple schools. And you may not think that it'll all get mumbo jumbled and that you have an ironclad memory, but they really, it really can start to mix, mix. And that's why it's also good to take photos too. to use your, so easy now with your, with your phone camera. That's snap right. Some, snap some pictures because um, I can't tell you how many times students say, oh, I'm starting to confuse this school with that school, <laughs> you know, you know and, that's that, right. and having that record of, at least this was my impression after I left and it may move as you learn more. And very hard on parents to keep, you know, zip their lips uh, before, you know, I used to say to families, uh, when you get in the car, 15 minutes of silence mm -hmm. while the student uh, makes notes, thinks, processes, and also where the parents have a chance to kind of lower their emotional energy, their reaction. And I tell you, I, you and I know how hard that is, but that's because we visit campuses professionally. Sure. We have a lot to say, but the, the, the student's reaction, and then, then parents ask a lot of questions. Ask your, your son or your daughter a lot of questions about their reactions, their impressions. Um, may, help them make notes about, based on this visit, what do you want to learn next? You know, what, it, what questions do you have in terms of follow-up? Susan, you and I could go another hour. I know. But we've had an hour. I'm going to cut us off only because I want to stay under an hour. But I, I love talking with you about this stuff. Same and here, so, Mark. So keep sending me these great articles, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. You bet. Thanks so much for the, uh, the time together. My pleasure. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, last week you heard the first part. Now it's time for the second part. All right, Lisa, let's look at Caden's other question. So she has another really awesome question, um, which is, what do you say if they ask you what other schools you're applying to? So let me talk a little bit about this question. So this question is one you're not supposed to ask. This is considered a breach of interview etiquette in admissions. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I started incorporating it into my training when last year I had four students ask this question, or maybe it was the year before. It was sometime in the last few years. The years starting to just go together, but four students got asked that question. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's a lot. And I, I don't really find admission officers asking this question, although I never want to say never, because they would certainly like to know. 
um, and senior fellows or students. So let me take a step back. There's three main people that do interviews. You know, the admission officers themselves, what I call senior fellows, but that's not, a, that's probably too specific a name. That's the name some schools call it. It's like, it's like a student who's an upper class person who's been usually very involved in the admission office. Maybe they started out as tours and they became a tour guide head. Then they do panel discussions at events. And then, um, and then they, you know, they move into this role of interviewing. And by the way, that's what the path to go on if you want to be in admissions. It's like, you want to know how to get an admissions job. This is the stuff you do. And, and then, and then alumni. And so those are the big three. Now, all four times when my students got asked this question, I think it was the year before last, like two years ago, it was always an alumni that did it. They were the ones. So the thing that I say with this, it's very similar to kind of what we said before. What's not a good answer is, um, I'm, you know, I'm not really comfortable t- discussing that. Um, that's not a good answer. Or... I also don't think it's a good answer just to say I'm re- mostly looking at schools like in the Midwest or or even mostly looking at like state schools. I do believe that you should have a little bit of transparency here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also do not believe you're obligated to tell your entire list. And there's a way of doing it that is not l- telling a lie and it's not being dishonest. And and the way you do it is you you give them a few names um, a, a few of the schools I'm going to be applied to are, you know, you mentioned four or five names. And then you say, I'm still researching. I'm sure I'm going to apply to more. I haven't really finalized everything yet. That to me is the way I advise. That's how I coach people to answer that. It, to me, it strikes the right balance between transparency and divulging a little bit, but not showing all your cards. Um, I think, well, let me ask you what you think about that, Lisa. Then I, and then I have another, another comment I want to make. Oh, I mean, I think that makes sense. I mean, I I think you could just, you know, I, I don't know if I were doing that interview, if somebody asked me that question, I'd be like, well, I'm really interested in schools that have great programs in acts such as blah, blah, blah. Of course, you know, this school is like, you know, really on one of the top on my list. Um, and I'm still finalizing my list, but I'm looking for schools that have similar, you know, attributes or whatever, like they have a a great engineering department or or whatever. Now, I'm going to say something that I'm embarrassed to say, but we're always trying to be transparent. So, you know, when I did boarding school admissions, we interviewed everybody. That was part of the process. Just it was just like required to require teacher recommendations, counselor letter, transcript, test scores, interview was a requirement. So activities list and, you know, cloud specific questions, all that stuff was all in there. So when I did admissions for the first multiple years, I asked everybody this question. I loved asking this question. I learned a lot from that question. For one, I learned who my competition was, you know, and secondly, I tried to see similarities between the schools. So it wasn't until later that I can't remember when it was, but at some point it sort of became clear, like that's not considered appropriate. And so I had to back off that. I hate it when I lost the ability to ask that question. But I remember one time when somebody gave me a kind of blow off answer, you know, to that question. I did not like it. You know, a blow off answer was, well, you know, not really just not not really sure if I want to talk about that right now or something like that. So I once again, I don't encourage people to do the blow off the way you did it, the way you said it could be perfectly fine. I'm interested in schools are strong. Name, Name your thing. Visual arts departments or environmental science majors. You know, and so some of the schools I'm looking at are blah, blah, blah. Now, so usually when I tell students this, then the the real deep thinkers, then they start getting really anal with me. So then they say, okay, if I'm going to share schools, do I share like my probables or do I share like my reach and stretch schools? So this is this is a very frequent question they ask me as a follow up. And it's actually a really good question. And the re- one of the reasons why it's a really good question is because you have to ask yourself, if somebody's going to ask the question, what other schools are you applying to? Why are they asking that question? Well, yeah, I wondered what you did with that information that you got when you were in boarding school admissions. So, I, so I'll, I'll tell you what I did with it. I knew right away who our competition was, especially if I really liked the student a lot. And you know the information, everybody knows the information about how well you yield against certain schools, against certain students. 
a certain, against certain schools. So if they came back and they said Phillips Exeter, Cho, Lawrenceville, Deerfield, St. Paul's, Lawrenceville, um, you know, uh, Hotchkiss, some other schools, I know those schools were tough for us to beat because they had more prestige. And prestige is always, it almost seems like it almost always comes down to that, or most of the time it does. Not that often people pick a, a less selective school over a more selective school. Like, does it happen? Yes, but it's more the exception than the norm. So I partly did it to get a sense of what, how hard was it going to be to yield a student. Sometimes I did it to get a sense of what are the commonalities and what are the patterns between what this student is, the, our, our school and the other schools on their list. So, for example, if they said to me, if they said to me the George School, which was a, our biggest overlap, and I'm also looking at a day school, let's say they said Sidwell Friends if they were in D.C., which was an overlap in D.C., or Friends Seminary if they were in New York, or Friends Academy if they're on Long Island. So sometimes I was looking for those patterns, and you kind of like those patterns because it shows some intentionality. So if they said, like I said, um, similarities in schools, and you saw a pattern between your school and their school, that you like that because you, you know that they were putting a little thought into their search. So sometimes it was a reflection of, oh, is there some thought here? If I see similarities in schools, I can tell, not only does it tell me a little bit about you, it, it's, it's an, it can be an insight into that person. I see similarities in schools, that tells me an insight into who you are and what you're probably looking for. Sometimes it was a reflection of how hard is it going to be to yield. And then sometimes... You know, you do an interview and you don't have any really academic information on the student. And so it can be a little bit of a insight into how strong of a student this is. So if somebody comes back and they tell you a whole bunch of schools that are less selective than you are, that may be one thing versus if they come back and they give you a whole bunch of really selective schools. I mentioned some of the some of the the very selective schools earlier, but there there's others as well. You know, I could have mentioned a bunch of others, and they start saying like the Groton School, and it's not a school I never mentioned. Um, Middlesex, pretty selective. They start mentioning some of these schools, Thatcher. Then that can also be an insight into how strong of an applicant this is, because normally, if like if you put it in college terms, it would be like, where else are you applying? And they're like, you know, Yale, Stanford, UPenn. Brown, you Chicago, Pomona, Rice. You're like, okay, this is pretty probably a pretty strong applicant. So that was one of the reasons for for asking it there as well. Any thoughts, Lisa? Well, you know, I think like as an applicant, I would kind of be wary of that question. I mean, we're not students are not allowed to ask. Okay, well, who from else are you considering for my school? Like, what do you think of Susie versus me? You know, you can't ask that. And that's kind of what the schools are asking. I guess to me, like, maybe this is bad advice. I would say make a list of the schools where this school is like, you know, like they're crossovers, but like this school is like the more slightly more prestigious one and tell them that so that they think they'll yield you. Um, but that's sort of disingenuous, yeah. I think. <laughs> I'm you always going to say, don't be disingenuous, Lisa. <laughs> but, you know, but it is a disingenuous question. Yeah, yes. still, I'm still, I'm still, you know. there's a way it can be answered authentically that doesn't hurt you. Mm -hmm. There's a way that can be answered. And, and, and the same thing we said in the last question, a lot of these questions are like, how confidently do you answer? Do you, can you think well on your feet? You know, do, and I, we didn't even get into things like, eye contact and smiling and how well you project and all those things, other things that are components of good interviews, because it's not a question how to do a great interview. It's a general question about specific questions. But a lot of times it's just another opportunity to show you can think well on your feet um, and you're confident, you know, to, to be honest. And so I wouldn't want to miss that opportunity. And you can, you can thread that needle between being authentic and still getting points for thinking well on your feet, answering the question. Sometimes the harder questions are the ones where you have an opportunity to shine because they're the questions where other people melt. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like college-specific questions, and, and most people who are writing supplements, so much. Because so many people don't do good ones. I love working on those with students because this is an opportunity for them to really shine. 
Right. That's and right. so that's how it can be on a tough question too. Like a lot of people aren't going to necessarily do that great on it. Once again, I don't want to put too much induced stress to people. A lot of interviews are more PR. They're more informational. Most of the time, people don't flub them. Um, sometimes they don't even get written up at all, you know, depending on the type of interview. Uh, increasingly, some of them are with schools are just checking a box. Did the person do the interview or not? Um, I would want everybody to know, uh, does a copy of these of the notes from this go into the file? If a copy of the notes goes into the file, then it's, to me, it's got an evaluative component, even oh, if they yeah. say that it's just informational. Um, but nowadays, it's so competitive out there. Schools are using interviews, you know, partly as a sign of demonstrated interest, but also to drum up interest in the school. You know, it's becoming like uh, like a yield tactic. Well, right. Because if you have that one-on-one Correct. contact with somebody, um, you know, then they're more likely to be able to tell you things that are really going to get you interested, make you feel like the school cares about you. I think it's a great marketing tactic. It is. Every time I see a student go to a school where someone gives them a very high touch experience, that school becomes tops on their list. It's like without fail, you know? I'm, I'm barely, I, you know, I'm, I'm into, I believe in it. I'm sold on high touch. And I think it's great when schools interview. And I think it's great when they, I love when I actually see admission officers do them to them too because like wow you're you're paying that salary and that's very you're really telling me that you're elevating this the 20 to 30 minutes to spend on that because it's longer than they're going to spend reading the application um i don't fault schools that don't use admission interviewers i realize it's really not practical when your applicant pool gets to be a certain size and so like using a well-trained student or alumni is great free labor and it can be, you know, maybe 80% or 80 to 90% as effective without being on your payroll. So, I mean, if I'm at a school that's like busting at the seams, you know, for for students, then I'm going to use, I'm going to tap into free labor. Um, some, you know, there are some schools, not that many, that also do faculty, use faculty members as well. But that's quite, that, I don't see that that often. Um, I see that a lot, a lot of times more for like special programs and things. Um, of all the interviews, but I should yeah. mention it because it does happen sometimes. I mentioned before, it's like more like the senior fellow and the, the alumni and the admission officer. But you're going to say something, Lisa? Oh, I just, I read this article today and I think it was in the Washington Post and maybe it came out on August 12th, but it was about how parents are stressing out kids too much about um, college application process and, you know, selectivity and all that. But the uh, writer suggested to kids that when they're being interviewed, they ask, like, you know, this, your school's great. It seems like a dream to me. But, you know, we both know that you don't, you can't accept everyone. Where else do you think I should apply? Um, And try to turn it around um, on them a little bit. And I don't know what you think about that. Uh, tactic, but I thought it was an interesting take on things. Yeah, I, I don't like the where else should I apply because h- how does the interviewer know you? They don't know you well enough. But one thing I do say to all of my students, okay, here we go. Now I'm going to go on to the third topic. This is a big one. I want them to have five questions Yes, that they're going to ask. And almost every interview is going to end with the question, what questions do you have for me? And so that you want to take advantage of, and you should not be, Absolutely. and you should not be afraid to ask tough questions there. Mm-hmm. Now, I tell most students that five is a lot to, for you to ask them all. Two to three is normally like kind of the sweet spot of sort of what's socially appropriate, what's in the timeline they've budgeted. But the reason why there's two reasons why I want them to have five. One is because what happens if in the course of the interview the interviewer just happens to go off on a tangent and answers two of your questions and you only had two questions. I tell you, it is a terrible look. And I hated this when I did it. When I said, what questions do you have for me? And and you don't have any. Because you come across like either you can't think well on your feet or you didn't prepare. So you never want to not have any. But if you only have two and then the, the interviewer tells you those two, you can't turn around and ask them the two they told you. They're like, did you, were you listening to me? So, so that's why I don't like students to only have two. And the reason why I want them to have five is because every, it's not that often, but it happens every, maybe I'm just guessing here, 2%, maybe 2% of the interviews my students have, they go something like this. 
So, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be Lisa, you know, you're the, you're the applicant. I'm, I'm Mark. I'm the admissions interview and we're Reed College. Um, I'm just going to say Reed because I just did a, I didn't even tell you this, Lisa, but I just finished a great interview with Reed. Can't wait for it to air. So Reed's on my mind. Of course, we talked a little bit about interviews in that, in that, in that, in that interview. So you read college and it goes like this. Uh, so Lisa, good to have you here today. My name's Mark. Uh, I've <clears throat> been here for about seven years. I'm a mission officer. Blah, blah, blah. I've got territories, including North Carolina and the Southeast, go all the way up to Virginia. And the purpose of this is really just to get to know each other a little bit more today. Um, it's really no, you know, question that's really off limits. Uh, don't feel, you know, need to feel pressure or anything. Um, it's really just a purpose of just kind of getting to know each other um, a little bit more. Um, and you may say a few things like, uh, I, I work with transfer students, I work with students in the Southeast, and, and I work a little bit on our tour guide program. So what questions do you have for me today, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? I knew it. <laughs> you knew the big wind up. And yeah. so if you get one of these interviews that literally is just, I'm going to introduce myself to you. I'm going to give a little preamble. And then the whole interview is your questions to me. Then you don't want, you don't want even two. You need to have more. Right. So that's why I like students to have five really good questions. And obviously, I think I might've shared this before, but you can Google excellent questions to ask in an admissions interview. And then put school match for you after it, and you'll get a list. And when I yeah, had my blog, they're going, phenomenal questions. Those are like the best questions, I think. That thank I've you, Lisa. I, I I recommend that to everyone um, that they need to take a look at that. So, well, I'm going to put a little plug, plug for Mark. Thank you. I'm going to put a little plug for <laughs> YCBK Plus. So that was back when we were blogging in 2016 and 17. When um, and then the blog had to go, and the podcast came back. But now that we've got extra help. Those are the kinds of things that we're going to be putting out when we restart yeah. the blog. Well, maybe we can bring that back, you know, like an updated No, version. we could do part two. Like maybe there's, you know, you could be like, how are you handling monkeypox? Like there's yeah. all sorts of new things that have come up and will come up um, for kids to be able, that are important for kids to know and to be able to ask about. So. You know, you you know what? Now that you give me a great, uh, great idea, I'm going to commit to doing it. So basically that article, I give 40 sample questions and then I and I show you how to create your own good question. Uh, but 40s, 40 is just scratching the iceberg. Can you do right, another, right. can do another 40, can do part two. So I think I, I'd like to do that. So maybe we can collaborate. So, but that's, that's so, so as far as that article, I would never turn it on a school and say, where do you think I should apply? They don't know you well enough and there's not enough time in the interview, but I would absolutely take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions. In fact, I think a lot of times when people think of an interview, they think, first thing they think of is, I need to try to impress them. But what should be just as high on your list, if not even higher, should be, I want to try to learn things about your school that I've been having a very difficult time getting answers to. Yeah, yeah. Like I've looked, uh, and that's, that's what, you, those are the questions you want to ask. Open-ended ones that you can't, you know, we call it in admissions, the three click rule. If, if you can click your mouse three times and find it, then it's not a good question. And, and, and so I'm really interested in philosophy and I'm really interested in chemistry and I'd like to double major. Like, what does that look like and what type of workload would that entail and how easy would that be for me to do? Like, that's the kind of question right. that's good because it's probably not that easy to get that, an that answer to that. Right. So that's what I would say. That's the part I would take from what you read is absolutely use it as an opportunity to ask questions. And I'll, here's what I'll tell you. Questions impress the good questions impress the heck of an admission officer. And most of the time they don't get them. So questions also are like call specific essays. They're an opportunity for you to really shine, really distinguish yourself really stand out. That's true for fairs. That's true for info sessions. That's true for school visits when they come to your school. I mean, I used to travel around and do those school visits. And <clears throat> afterward, right away, I went right to the placement person and said, tell me about that, that kid with the, with the, with the uh, Boston Celtics sweater on. Tell me a little bit more about, about, about her. I like her. Tell me, you know, like, and, and, and that was me doing boarding school admissions when I was doing college counseling working with Susan, all of our visitors would come to a room called the South Room. And sometimes I would, I would 
take the lead on that and be the one in there hosting. And after they were done, the admission officers, college admission officers would say the same thing to me. Tell me a little bit more about that kid. I really like the questions they asked. I like their energy. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think like the key and, you know, I say this, I don't know if I can actually pull this off myself and I certainly couldn't have done it when I was 17, but you have to think, you know, this is my opportunity to evaluate this school. And, Correct. you know, I have just as much choice in this Correct. matter as the other person. If you can approach every job interview is just like, I'm just kind of going to see if this place is a good fit for me or not. Um, it's going to make it so much easier for you to relax, to think on your feet, to ask probing questions uh, and to be more authentic. If you're trying to impress someone and you're coming from that nervous, like I, I can't ever admit a weakness or I have to look perfect. It, it's not going to work well because people sense that and that makes them uncomfortable too. So that is the key, I think, for so much in life. It's just don't sell yourself short, you know, um, go in there. Like you think about, you know, do I like the school? Not does the school like me? And try to have that as your mindset. And I think it'll go better for you. And um, I agree with 100% with everything you said there. People have confidence and people have, people have confidence in you if you have confidence in yourself. Um, also, and you'll hear admissions officers say this, it's it's actually literally true. So when you start out, whatever number, whatever, you know, there's lots of numbers out there. Whether you you go with the high end, where they count every imaginable school, even the, the unaccredited ones. I usually like to go 2,500. Uh, it's the best data I've seen on how many four-year accredited schools that are, you know, <clears throat> that are capable of getting federal funding and everything, bachelor's granting institutions, you're picking from that group who you're applying to. Right. You have all mm -hmm. the power. Let's say you're going to apply right. to 10 schools. You pick, you just pick 10 out of 2,500. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now they are picking, they're deciding whether they're going to admit you or deny you or waitlist you or defer you. So you feels to you like they have all the power, but when you're admitted, Let's say you get in six of the 10. Now you have all the power again. You're picking between those six. So at two of the three huge parts in this decision-making process, where you apply 10 out of 2,500, okay, sure, the pendulum switch to them. They get to pick and choose what happens. But then if you applied wisely, other than early, other than early decision, which we know is binding, you're going to have some choices. Look at, look, look at, look at your daughter. You said before that she didn't want to apply ED. If I remember correctly, she, didn't she apply to like 13 and get in 12? She had a, she applied to like 14 schools and she got into all 14 schools. Wow. I think like Boston University is like a deferred admission, um, but she still was admitted. She still could have gone there just like one semester later. So she had, so she had all the power. Yeah. She, she look at the power that she had. She had the power to pick the 14. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then she literally got in all of her schools. So that was probably like almost an extreme example. But yeah. the point is you do have a lot of power. So use the yeah. interview to try to get answers, try to understand things about this school that you're really having a hard time learning through all of your other research, parts of research. If you have that mindset more than this is my opportunity to impress, it will serve you well. Right. Absolutely. Well, I have a teeny vignette to share about this. This is actually about preschool admission. So when Lily was <laughs> three, you know, she went to this Montessori school that was local and we really loved it. But I had this friend who's like, oh, you've got to take Lily and, and you've got to go visit like fancy pants, you know, country day school. And so I was like, gosh, well, I want to be a good mom. So even though it's like a million dollars to go there, I better take my kid over there. And so she's like, what are we doing? Like, we're going to go check out this school. So Lily walks in the school, they're showing her things. And she loved her teacher at the Montessori school. Her name was Mrs. Franks. And the lady said, well, Lily, do you have any questions? She's like, yeah, does Mrs. Franks work here? And the she's like, well, who's that? She's like, oh, my preschool teacher. She's fantastic. And the lady's like, no, no, Mrs. Franks doesn't work here, Lily. And Lily's like, oh, well, that is such a loss for you. And I'm like, okay, we're out. This is done. She was, she was that way before she was five. Oh, my gosh. She was born now. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I thought, dang, like I couldn't, I can't do that as a grown up. Like, but she like played that so well. And that pick you know, up some swagger from your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was not going to go there. She was not even going to give them the time of day. <laughs> and the truth is that all my kids went to that Montessori preschool and they all had an amazing experience there. So it was, it was all fine. But I just, I just remember that moment. It's just like, oh. Yeah, this kid's really smart. I just learned like, something well about you. I just learned something about you. I didn't know. But both What's that? That your all your kids went to Montessori school. All my kids went to Montessori schools for preschool. I well, love Montessori yeah, for yeah, preschool. Yeah. And you know, um, you know, when Lily was younger, they weren't teaching kids to read in the regular schools with phonics. Um, they were doing this context cues things. I, I think even with Thomas and, but at the Montessori, they were old school and they taught them phonics. All my kids, you know, went into kindergarten reading really well, which was good because I think I would work in the classrooms as a volunteer. And so many of those kids, like, you know, they just couldn't figure out what the word was, like, you know, based on the other words next to it. So I was was, I've been very grateful for that. I think it gave them an excellent start. Well, this was a good advertisement for Montessori. Two, you, yeah. you were three for three, and I was two for two. And, <laughs> and my kid, they went to different. Joy went to two Montessori's. One was a three was a three year pro, for three year olds, and a different one for four or five. And the Karis just did the four or five before they they went on. But anyway, Cadence, these were great questions. We really, really Absolutely. thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck with your interviews, Cadence. Yeah, good I'm luck, sure Cadence. You're kill it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Thank you. And now this week's interview with a special guest. We start a brand new interview and I'm joined by Julia this time. It's Heath Einstein, who's over the admission office at Texas Christian University, better known as TCU. Friends, I'm here with Heath Einstein and Julia Esquivel. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Heath and Julia. Great to be here. Thanks for having us, Doug. So, so Julia, you and Heath go back. Why don't you t- talk a little bit about how you know Heath? Yeah, I'm actually curious if our stories will match up because I was I was a baby admissions officer um, and I had heard of Heath's name. So when I worked at... Haverford College. I actually wanted Texas as my regional territory for the longest time for the food, mostly. Um, And I was in Dallas and I went to an independent school, all girls independent school called the Hockaday School. And who was there to greet me but Heath, who clearly had a lot of experience in the field. I did not. And treated me right away um, with so much respect and care and concern. Um, And I also liked uh, that Heath was a straight shooter. He was really supportive of the students I met with and also really honest with me about how he thought they might navigate the process when applying to Haverford, which was really helpful. And then since then, I think I'm not the only person that feels this way. Heath is just everywhere, like pops up everywhere. <laughs> and even though he gets quoted a lot and he has really great leadership roles and he's considered a thought leader in our world, he is never too big to say hi to you and to care and to also have fun and laugh and um, be really bold, but also really balanced at the same time in this field. Does that line up with your story, Heath? Yeah. Um, well, everything except all the nice things that Julia <laughs> said about me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I remember when we when I was at Hockaday and I had um, our intrepid counselor from Haverford come to visit, and it was great. And I, I wouldn't have known if you hadn't said that you were first year or. Uh, new counselor, new ish counselor, I wouldn't have known because you carried yourself with such grace and, um, and like you, like you knew what you were doing, which you did. Um, and so, yeah, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful, uh, relationship right from the, right from the get go. And, uh, and I really do Julia appreciate those nice things that you said about me. Um, I, 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 well, basically what you're saying is I'm overexposed, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's funny. So I have to share some of my take. First of all, I lived in Dallas for seven and a half years, but this is in the late 80s and early 90s. It was a while ago. Um, I actually did a year of, of college admissions, but 
it was like a non-competitive school and it really was a turnoff for me actually the school had such financial problems i went in another direction for a while and then i um you know i started doing college admissions and i've been hearing more and more great things about tcu especially from some of my friends over at westminster here in atlanta and um i started referring you guys a fair amount um and i was getting really good feedback from people on their visits and then I listened to you. You're on another podcast, like a dad and his son. Yes. Yeah. And I thought you were fantastic on there. And I was Thank like, you. who is this guy with these insights? So I, I, you know, I did a little back, a little search on your background. And I'll ask you to talk about that. But I wasn't surprised at all to learn you were on the other side of the, the aisle. And then I started actually checking you out. You'd have a lot of stuff up on YouTube, I guess, formerly Facebook. <laughs> videos that are now on YouTube. Yeah, we put it all out there. Yeah, yeah, and it was really good stuff. And so I'll say this really recently and then I'll and then I'll let you share your own background in your own words. I've gotten to know Rick Clark pretty well. He's right here in the city and we get together. And I was having lunch with him recently and I and I was complimenting him because of his authenticity and how transparent he is. And I said, "You remind me of a guy named Heath Einstein." I think the two of you <laughs> And he's like, that's a compliment because Heath is really good. So <laughs> so, so now you have big shoes to fill here after that intro. <laughs> oh, well, not not only big shoes to fill because of all the things you said, but specifically Rick Clark. I mean, that dude is a is a giant in the field. And, um, you know, he's one of those people who you look at him and he looks like he's, I don't know, 35 and like he just started recently. But he's been doing it for a long time and he's so dang good. And he's like he raises the bar for everybody. Um, and, and not only does he know what he's talking about, but he's such a good human being. I've gotten to know Rick a little bit over the years and just really, really, uh, respect the heck out of him. Well, I think you two are really similar. So why don't you, why don't you tell us about your background and certainly want you to talk about anything admissions related, but anything else you want to share that you think would, I would help our listeners as well. Well, my background, uh, in terms of my professional experience, I think is a little bit circuitous, and you alluded to this already. Um, I started in the field at my alma mater, uh, the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., um, over, let's see, 21 years ago now, I think. And I spent a few years in that office, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. There's something fun about working for your alma mater, um, living in Washington, D.C., at a in your 20s is really fun. Um, I think especially back then when it was somewhat less toxic than, than it is today. And, um, and, and it, so all was going well. And then I realized that, you know, things might be going a little too well. Everyone seems to love working here. And if, you, and if you're in our field, you've probably met a bunch of people who worked at GW. We've got our little GW mafia um, <laughs> because we all realize, you know what, there's no real room for advancement because people seem to stay there forever. And this is sort of a truism, I think, in, in college admissions that you you either move up or you move out. And so I realized pretty quickly I needed to do something else. And it so happens at the time that my then girlfriend, now wife, um, was finishing her master's at GW and was looking to do something professionally that would take us out of Washington, D.C. So we moved to New York. And before I even had an opportunity to look for admission positions, a friend of mine who was a college counselor at a school on Long Island said to me, the former principal at that school was now at a school in Westchester County, and they were looking for a college counselor. They, it was a brand new school. They had never had a college counselor before. Um, and would this interest me? It was a Jewish day school called Solomon Schechter School of Westchester. And uh, the, the opportunity to build a program from the ground up was very appealing to me. Um, so I spent four years there. It was fantastic. And it was, it was a truly uh, true growth experience for me because I had never done it before. And the school had never done it before. Uh, you know, it was like every day we were just flying by the seat of our pants, but we were doing it collaboratively. I had the chance to work on the leadership team. So I was building a skill set that went even beyond the college counseling program. And so I think some of the leadership 
skills that I carry with me today really date back to those pivotal four years um, uh, in New York. We decided, my wife and I decided, you know, living here on two salaries in the nonprofit world probably was not <laughs> sustainable. So uh, we looked to other parts of the country. She grew up in North Texas. That led us to uh, to Dallas, which is when I started at Hockaday, met Julia. Um, I was there for four years. And I had an opportunity um, to connect with the then dean of admission at TCU, a man by the name of Ray Brown. He served on the Texas Association for College Admission Counseling board as its president. I was on the board. Um, I think at that time I was the government relations chair. I was in some, some position on the board. And I got to talking to Ray. and We just had a really good chemistry. We got to know each other well. And I said to him, you know, what is the chance that someone like me could work in admissions someday again? Um, by that point, I had been on the high school side for seven or eight years. I really enjoyed it and could have been happy staying there. But there was a part of me that always wanted to get back. I think this sort of in the in the back of my mind, um, I had left admissions because of circumstantial reasons, not because I um, hated the terrible pay or hated the long hours or, you know, uh, nights and weekends and all that stuff. I actually, you know, I, I love that. I loved working in admissions, but it was just, you know, life took me in a different direction. So I said, what, are the, what could someone like me expect reasonably to, um, if I, if I expressed interest and he said, you're great, you could definitely do this. Um, and you could come in at a high level. It doesn't have to be as a, as a road runner, which I, that by that point I had two kids. I now have three kids. I could not have done that. I needed something sure. that was in, in a, uh, position of, of leadership. Um, unbeknownst to either of us at the time, the director of freshman admission, uh, a guy by the name of Wes Wagner, who you might know, um, was leaving to take the job as dean at SMU. Um, and so a couple months later, Ray reached out to me and he said, hey, you know, you had asked about getting back into admissions. Um, I might have a, a job here. Well, what do you think? And so I interviewed and the rest is history. So I've been at TCU now for, the, for I just passed the 10 year mark. Um, it seems like I just got here yesterday. I feel like I'm constantly learning, uh, learning new tools to add to the to the kit, um, which which makes life fun. And we've got an incredible staff, very passionate about this place. And there's a lot to be passionate about. Well, that's fantastic. And we, before we get to that, I do have a question I have to ask. All three of us have one thing in common. We've all been on the school side. I, I did this at the Westtown School, Quaker Boarding School, you may know, in yep. Pennsylvania from 01 to 09. And now Julia's on the school side. And I've been at KIPP in Atlanta for the last 14 years. How has being on the other side of the desk changed the way you do admissions? It's everything. It, it is everything. Every decision that we make is centered in the student experience. And it is because I had eight years of seeing how those decisions made in admission offices played out on high school campuses um, that, that I'm informed by, by that. So um, I'll give you a really simple example of this, and this won't surprise either of you, um, because it's pretty commonplace now um, that we release admission decisions after the school day's over. Because if you send out decisions at noon or 10 o'clock a.m. Or, or anything like that, um, it is completely disruptive, not just to that student, but to every person that student comes into contact with. Um, so it's a simple example, but, but that's the kind of thing that we, that we think about um, with everything that we do. That is awesome. And, and that's quite honestly what I felt was coming through when I heard you on that other podcast. There's an insight level there, and I think it goes back to this. So, so thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate you, you sharing your background. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, our recommended resource for episode 253 is a blog. And the name of that blog, studentloanplanner.com forward slash blog. If that sounds kind of familiar to you, it's because the founder of the blog, Travis Hornsby, has been a guest on our podcast before. Go back to episode 101 and we had him on talking about student loans, student loan debts, 
and best strategies to get those debts wiped off your record. Well, now, if you're trying to follow what's going on with loan forgiveness, Biden's plans, or anything at all to do with student loans, maybe your child has a lot of loans, and maybe you have loans as a parent, or maybe your child's about to have loans in grad school, or maybe you're a college counselor. I don't know of a better resource than studentloanplanner.com forward slash blog, and it's our recommended resource for episode 253. We'll now return to my interview with Heath Einstein. So let's talk a little bit about TCU. So you bump into somebody, uh, Uber driver, and they've got a kid. Hey, I've got a kid in 10th, 11th grade. Tell me about this TCU. Like, what what, what do you say? Let's just leave it open-ended, and you can take it where you want to go with it. Well, the first thing I'm going to say to that parent is, uh, how's life in your household right now? <laughs> and, <laughs> and is your student enjoying high school? Because mm-hmm. I think we so often focus on what's coming next that sure. it, it prevents the student from gaining a full uh, 9th through 12th experience. And I know because I've got a rising 10th grader how it can become all-encompassing. Uh, we were very clear, my wife and I, before my daughter started ninth grade, that she is not going to hear from us about college, that she can come to us when she's ready to talk about it. But we will not be pushing this because I have seen so often um, families becoming temporarily destroyed um, a- a- as a result of this this uh, looming college decision. But to get back to your question, if I'm approached by somebody and they say, tell me about TCU, um, the sort of elevator pitch, and, the, and, and, and this is genuine, is what distinguishes TCU in a crowded ecosystem is that you can, on the one hand, have the resources that you would find at a, at a large research institution, um, but the experience that you typically would see at a small liberal arts college. And combined with that, you are in a major, uh, major uh, city in the United States. Uh, Fort Worth by itself is the is the twelfth largest city in the U.S. with a population close to a million. When you combine that with Dallas, which downtown to downtown is forty five minutes, Mark, you know this. Um, yep. The entire metro area is the number four um, metropolitan area in the country. So you have exposure to anything that you could want in a city, and yet we've got a beautiful residential campus. So we feel like we've got the sort of the best of everything, and and that big and small, which a lot of colleges claim to do and 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 can do uh, to some extent, um, I think what's different about TCU is that we are primarily undergraduate. So if you look at other schools that play in major Division I conferences, whatever that means right now, because it seems like conference <laughs> conferences are realigning by the day, um, you aren't going to find another school that has the percentage of undergraduates that TCU has. So you can go to a football game with 50,000 people on a Saturday in the fall and get that rah-rah experience that you'd find at a public flagship, but you would have the attention from faculty that you'd see on a campus of 2,000 or 3,000 students. That's the secret sauce of TCU. And it's that's really appealing because, I mean, I, Julian can attest to this as well. There's a lot of people we work with that, one, prefer to be undergraduate oriented if they're an undergrad. Two, they may find the small liberal arts to be smaller than they want. Either it doesn't have the engineering or the business or it's just smaller. And, they're, and they'll say to us, I just need something bigger than my high school. Right. You know? um, but then they're not necessarily looking for that 30,000 plus school that you get with flagship and land grant schools. And in fact, just yesterday, literally, I, I, I was talking to a student and they said to me, I don't think I can go under 3,000, but around 12 is probably where I'm most coming. I said, you, you know, there's not really that many schools in that range, right? <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, yeah, so that, that's a good sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's why we can attract students from the Westminster School in Atlanta, and we can attract students from Plano West in in suburban Dallas, where you with graduating classes that are like, sure. a, you know, two thousand people or something crazy like that. You know, because the student can find what exactly what it is they're looking for on our campus. 
So TCU has a mission. How would you say the mission impacts the student experience? Oh, the mission is so important here. The, so our mission is to educate individuals to think and act as ethical leaders and responsible citizens in the global community. And he was ready for me. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't even know you were going to ask that question. I know. <laughs> um, but if you were to ask anybody at TCU what our mission is, they would be able to tell you. Um, if not verbatim, they get really close because we talk about this a lot, not just in information sessions that are led by the admission office, but once students arrive here, whether it's in the classroom, on the athletic fields, in the residence halls, the mission undergirds what's happening on this campus. Um, and so, um, uh, I mean, even to the, to the point of how our core curriculum works, um, there is an element of our core curriculum called heritage, mission, vision, and values. So the mission is actually working its way in very much in a very direct way into the, into the academic experience that our students have, uh, have here on campus. So one thing that I sometimes find is that now this is both TCU and the school that you're often compared to, SMU, right? I'm sorry, um, I'm not familiar with them. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it can be challenging at times for students to consider either school when I when I bring them up in, in my experience um, for their college list, because what I'll oftentimes hear right away is I'm not Methodist for SMU or I'm not Christian for TCU. So how would you answer the question, why should I consider TCU if I don't identify as a Christian? Stuck, when I was applying for the job as dean of admission. Um, you go through sort of a, a, a gauntlet of an interview. Um, and it was, a, it was like a day and a half interview. And the centerpiece of it was an open forum with the entire community. Anybody can, can show up. And you're, it's an hour uh, presentation. Uh, well, really a half an hour followed by Q&A. And, and so the prompt I was given is, tell us a pressing issue in higher education. I mean, it's pretty open-ended like that. And you can present anything what you want. So I put together this PowerPoint on um, basically the uh, the importance of, of creating uh, inclusive communities uh, on college campuses. And um, so I, I do the presentation, open it up for questions. And the, and the first question that's asked is, you know, you talk about the importance of diversity. What is the first thing TCU should do to create an inclusive community. And I said, well, that's easy. Hire a Jew as your dean of admission. <laughs> <laughs> and got a lot of laughs. In fact, I got the provost to laugh, which was really Im Im impressive. I, I, I thought I'd never seen that guy laugh. Um, no, he's great. He's great. Um, and, um, but, I, but, but I do think that it says something that not just me, but others in positions of leadership here aren't Christian. Um, now, I don't mean to downplay the importance of our heritage. We were founded in 1873 by two ministers of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. And, uh, and that's important. But what's, in, what's if you dig a little deeper, what's even more important about that is to understand what the disciples believe, which is that there is no one right path that there is this concept of faith with reason, that we don't just accept ideas uh, on its face, but only through rigorous exploration do we come to some greater understanding about the world around us. And the disciples are an ecumenical faith. So from our beginning, there were people here who were not disciples and not Christian. Um, this is an incredibly diverse community in all of its forms, not the least of which is religious diversity. We have students here, indeed, who are Christian, we have students here who are Muslim, who are uh, who are Hindu, who are Baha'i, and and everything in between. We have dozens of faith communities represented on this campus. What you can expect as a member of the TCU community is that your faith will be respected, however you choose to to practice, or if you choose not to practice. And every year when we administer the admitted student questionnaire. Uh, which is a survey given to students who've been admitted, whether they choose to enroll or not. What we hear consistently among the top five reasons students choose not to enroll at TCU is TCU is too religious and T 
TCU is not religious enough. Hmm. So it all, it just matters <laughs> what your, your, what your expectation is. Um, we are who we are. We're unapologetic about it. I think this is a wonderful community from that standpoint. Um, the name can throw you for sure. I mean, when, if you were to have asked me 20 years ago, if I were to end up at a place where the words Texas and Christian appear right next to each other, I would have <laughs> told you you were crazy. But as I got to learn more and more about TCU, I came to find this is actually an incredible community. Um, and I've never once been made to feel uncomfortable. And so I talk to students about that. Anytime I, there's a student who isn't Christian um, and is concerned about it, you know, everyone in the office just throws that person my way. And we and <laughs> talk, we talk to the about Jewish it. guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> talk to the Jewish guy. Thank you, Heath, for that, because I often use you as an example when I talk to my uh, northeastern stu area students who have no problem with BC or uh, Georgetown. Right. But <laughs> so I always uh, use you as an example of um, I think it's OK because um, so. Right. But you spoke a bit about the inclusive spirit and this idea of everyone belonging. And what I also have learned in my time is that there is an extreme amount of school spirit, mostly with with your mascot of the horned <laughs> frogs. Yeah. Um, and I actually don't know where horned frogs comes from, but also beyond knowing that students seem really happy and are smiling all the time. How do you think uh, school spirit is articulated at TCU? Well, to answer your, your uh, the question that I guess you didn't exactly ask, but but maybe you want to know, um, the horned frog, it, it was, this is your fun fact of the day, the horned frog is the state reptile of Texas. Yeah. Um, who, knew that, that. who knew that we even had a state reptile? But yeah. it's true. So horned frogs, they're like they're like little lizards. They're actually quite adorable. They're found primarily in arid climates. Um, so if you're out in the fields of West Texas, you'll you'll see a lot of horned frogs. Um, or if you're at the Fort Worth Zoo, which is about a, a mile from where I'm seated right now, you'll see horned frogs. Um, but but so but we're unique because there are no other horned frog mascots. We like that. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, school spirit is pervasive on this campus. And it is something that you feel and see the minute that you get here. Uh, everything from the street signs being purple to horned frogs being etched into chairs um, to horned frog tiles in the bathrooms, it is everywhere. And that might sound silly or quaint or um, or something else that, that you would define as unimportant, but actually it helps bring the community together. Our students love being here. And it was something I recognized, again, from, from the moment I stepped foot on campus. In fact, I remember being here for the first time as a counselor at Hockaday, because I had had students who were starting to look at TCU, and I thought, well, you know, the place is only, you know, less than an hour from here. I, I ought to look at it. And when I when I walked around and saw how nice everybody was and people throwing up the go frog sign, which I realize your listeners can't see right now, but it's uh, if you were to take a, a peace sign with your fingers and then curve your fingers down all the way. And we say, take a peace sign and make it angry. That's, that's our sign. <laughs> we say go frogs and everybody was doing it and everybody was wearing TCU apparel. And I remember when I was in college I went, again, I went to GW and there were people who wore GW sweatshirts, but there were also people, a lot of people who were wearing gear from maybe where their parents went to college or where they really wanted to go to college or whatever. And at TCU, you don't see that. Everybody here is just, just gaga about this place. And when I was here for the first time, I thought it was a facade. I thought surely they were just, you know, rolling out this purple carpet for me because I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't really know the place and they just want me to, you know, they, they just wanted to hoodwink me. But no, I mean, again, I've been here 10 years and it is genuinely like that. And while, again, that might not sound all that important, if you're spending the kind of money that families are investing in the college experience, you kind of want your kid to be satisfied with that. And if you look at surveys that are taken with our alumni, 
they would come here again and again and again. Um, so the student experience is outstanding. And I think that spirit has a, has a lot to do with that. That was actually something Mark and I had chatted about as well, is that that is my sense of TCU, is this like a friendly, happy atmosphere. Do you know where that came from or what sustains that vibe or life force, or is it just inherent in the community? I don't think it happens by accident. I do, I do think there is something um, here that, there is something in sort of in the life force that that just sort of breeds uh, on itself, right? Because because if you have a happy atmosphere, you're going to attract people who want to be there, mm. and so there is there is a little bit of a snowball effect. But it does take a lot of hard work um, from the the staff and the faculty. Um, we have a chancellor, Victor Buscini, who um, who is just the most spirited and friendly college president you will ever find. Um, and, and so I think that that does start at the top and work its way down. Um, and I know as somebody who is responsible for hiring people on our staff, that there are qual specific qualities I'm looking for in our employees, people who very much see team over self, people who, um, to the extent that you can see this in an interview are positive and, and have this sort of um, energy about them that, and they and they're looking to be part of this environment. And I consistently hear when when we interview people, when I call people to tell them that we we aren't able to offer them the job, there is disappointment in their voice, not just that they're not getting a job, but that they're not getting a job here. And they'll say, I had such a great time meeting all of you in the interview process. And you could tell it's not they're not just saying that because I've already told them they haven't gotten the job. Um, and I don't think we're the only office on campus that's like that. So it is very much cultural at TCU. This is awesome. Talk, talk to us about the campus because the campus gets rave reviews from people. We don't have the visuals to show, but paint a picture in the eyes of our listener of what, of what they would see if they were to visit campus. Well, I think we have a beautiful campus that is both traditional residential and in a city. So again, Fort Worth is a, is a major city, but we're not downtown. We are a, a few miles from downtown, easily accessible, so a student can get downtown in 10 minutes. But um, if you were to drive from uh, Interstate 30, which is the major highway um, that, that cuts right through Fort Worth, um, and, and head south, you would get off at University Boulevard, uh, University Drive, rather, um, and University bisects our campus. And on the east side of our campus is primarily where our uh, academic buildings are. Um, and on the west side of campus, primarily residential. There's a little bit of um, overlap there. And then um, if you were to go even farther west across stadium, you get to where all of our athletic fields are. So there's a, there's a method to the madness here as you're walking around. The university underwent a significant physical facelift about 15 years ago. We invested um, uh, several hundred million dollars to reface the university. And um, it was done with such meticulous care architecturally and in terms of landscaping to the degree that as you are walking, your eyes are drawn to just what's on the horizon. So it's sort of like the physical space moves you forward without your legs doing it for you. Um, and, it's, and it's beautiful. And the buildings have a very consistent look to them. So you know exactly where you are at all times. We've got the TCU brick. Uh, it's a branded TCU brick. Um, and... Um, and, and just a beautiful center of our campus too, the campus commons with residence halls that flank um, both north and south. And then on the west, you've got the Brown Lupton University Union, where, which is a hub of activity. And on the, um, on the east border of the campus commons, you've got Scarborough Hall, which is currently home to the John V. Roach Honors College, although they're moving into a new space, um, and other academic uh, offices and Frog Fountain right there, which is the iconic image 
of, of the university. You've got this fountain that has four levels um, with, with each one representing uh, each of the four years at TCU. Cool, cool. Friends, this concludes the first part of our three-part interview. I hope you'll join us next week for part two of three. On Monday's episode, you'll hear the final part of my interview with Tom Becker. And in that interview, we'll cover, did Pitt have more of a surge of applications in certain majors or all majors? How was yield impacted by the surge of applications? How did certain institutional priorities impact admissions? Tom shares more about the Honors College at Pitt. How does it work? And what are Pitt's strategic priorities moving forward? What do students feel are Pitt's greatest strengths? How do merit scholarships work? And where can Pitt improve? And of course, Tom goes on the hot seat. And before we get into that, I'm going to have some more details about the Biden's IDR, Income Driven Repayment Plan, and the loan forgiveness announcement. That'll be in our announcement section. I'm going to do something I've never done before. Uh, I'm going to close out our session with something that Heath Einstein says in episode 257 that is so profound that I don't even want to wait a few weeks for you to hear it. So I close with the words of wisdom from Heath Einstein. All right. And the last question is your best advice for three groups of people, students, parents, college counselors. My best advice to students is as you consider where you will go to college, imagine yourself as a rubber band and you want to go somewhere that is going to stretch you, perhaps to places that you didn't expect to be stretched, but not to the point where you break. Ooh. My advice to parents is that you have only one job in this process, and that is to love your child. Mm. And at the end of the day, if your feelings toward your child have anything to do with the bumper sticker that's going on in the car, then you may cause irreparable harm to that relationship. So just remember to love your children and to tell them that you love them. And to counselors, my advice is have enough wine for the whole year because <laughs> you're probably going to, you're probably going to need it. <laughs> and that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 14. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel and to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Talianos Dimitru. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, just text me at 404 404- 664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcasts. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Thursday.